there's one beverage associated with Western Pennsylvania. It's whiskey with the Whiskey Rebellion in 1791. We're actually at a pretty important site of the whiskey making industry in Western Pennsylvania. This dates back to the 1830s and it's kind of gone forgotten about because of somebody who was born here, somebody who went on to revolutionize, his industries revolutionized Western Pennsylvania. It wasn't with whiskey though, it was with coke, coal, and steel. We're here at West Overton, just outside of Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. This was one of the earliest distilleries in Western Pennsylvania in the birthplace of Henry Clay Frick. Let's go check it out. West Overton technically rests midway between Mount Pleasant and Scottsdale, not far off of Route 119. But when the property was first developed way back in the day, it truly was in the middle of nowhere. And that's not by accident. Henry Overholt moved his Mennonite family out here to take advantage of the vast fertile lands that the cities lacked back east. His son Abraham would reap the benefits of the move and began to turn his father's farm into a distillery. Now, why whiskey? Well, out here in the middle of nowhere, whiskey was a multi-purpose product. Obviously, it becomes a popular adult beverage, but you also have the medicinal purposes. It's easy for a farmer to create, especially with the vast fertile lands developed here in western Pennsylvania. In the early days of the country, it was even used as an informal currency, which caused a certain rebellion that we'll do a video on someday. Now note, Abraham was a Mennonite. You can imagine how the church felt when he took the steps to start distilling whiskey commercially. That was a big no-no, not just in his own Mennonite church, but also the Lutheran church his wife was from. While I don't want to question the man's faith, it's safe to say he liked to test the bounds of his own reality. Making a dollar for his family was more important than his belief system. What spared him from being shunned by the church was how high in regard his wife was held in. His industrious nature would rapidly change the family's small wooden still house into an increasingly larger distilling facility. Eventually, Abraham settled on an impressive five-story brick structure in 1859, which still remains on the property. Back in 1810, Abraham started out producing 15 gallons a day. By the 1830s, 150 gallons a day were being pumped out of West Overton. The increase in production required extensive manpower, leading to a small community rising around the distillery. This included a general store, multiple homes for workers and their families. Many of these structures still remain on the property. At present, a guided tour primarily focuses on a small piece of what was once a 263 acre farm, that being Abraham Overholt's homestead and adjacent structures. You'll learn about the life of the Overholt and some of the quirks of Abraham, like a tall tale that says he always had a bottle of rye on standby in the closet next to his bed. I'm sure he only used it when he had to, which, considering he's running one of the largest distilling enterprises in the country and raising a family of several children, I'll let that up to you, the viewer, decide when he had to take a sip. The bedroom is the first thing you'll see as it watches over the distilling building from the first floor. Prior to entering the house, a tour group is given a general history of the property in a sparsely furnished spring house. Aside from this being the Overholt's main water source, this building was home to another controversial element of Abraham's life. His daughter Elizabeth had fallen in love with one of the workers at the distillery, John Wilson Frick. Abraham will not allow his daughter to marry someone he viewed beneath the Overholt name. But shortly after, Elizabeth revealed she was already five months pregnant. Abraham begrudgingly approved their marriage, but only gave them his spring house as their first home. Their first child, Mariah, was born here in 1848. Their second was also born in this building at the end of 1849, Henry Clay Frick. At the time of Frick's birth, Abraham had been running the company alongside two of his older sons under the title A. Overholt & Company. His sons had developed a second distillery in the early 1850s, a few miles south in Broadford, PA. But when Jacob Overholt died in 1859, Abraham bought out his son's shares, giving him most of the control over both distilling operations, making him one of the most powerful men in the industry. And in his elder years, though he was not impressed with his son-in-law's failed business ventures, his grandson Henry seemed to have the knack for business. Henry Frick would have his earliest job clerking at one of the general stores in West Overton before taking over lower administrative works. But Frick had his eyes set outside the whiskey industry. He knew of a coal deposit on the property and Abraham had been using to help fuel the steam ran gristmill. 
Knowing of the rising steel industry in Pittsburgh, Frick used his access to coal to begin making coke for the mills. A reproduced beehive oven now sits on the property to commemorate the first of what would have been hundreds of ovens operated under the H.C. Frick Coke Company. Frick didn't even make all of his own money because he got all of that whiskey money pretty much. By 1880, Frick would be a millionaire and one of the most powerful and feared men in the country. But he didn't forget old Overholt. He and two other partners, one of which being Andrew Mellon, kept shares in the distillery. The other partner, Andrew Mock, helped to commemorate what Abraham had created by emblazing his face right on the new labels. For many generations, Abraham may just be the most iconic face associated with alcohol. Over the years, the label has been continually tweaked to flatten the angry frown the old man had. Old Overhaul was one of America's oldest and most popular whiskeys and never showed any signs of waning. But when Prohibition began, nobody was safe from the distilling industry. By the 1920s, an elderly melon had taken over ownership of Old Overhaul and managed to use his sway as newly elected Secretary of Treasury to get an exemption to keep producing medicinal whiskey. The West Overton facilities, though, could not survive on this meager demand and were shut down. Mellon sold his shares in 1925 to a New York grocer, who in turn sold it to a national distilling company at the end of Prohibition. The Broadford facility still ran well into the 1950s. Eventually, Jim Bean ended up with the rights and moved all production out of the area. Although the whiskey making was gone, West Overton was not forgotten. Frick's daughter, Helen, took interest in preserving the grounds of her father's birth. However, she cared little about the actual history that occurred with Abraham and instead turned the overhauled homestead into the Museum of Western Pennsylvania. I think a more appropriate title would be the Helen Frick Art Gallery. She changed large portions of the interior of the home to reflect the history of the region, little to do with the rooms they occupied. In the parlor, for example, she commissioned artist $84,000 in today's money to painstakingly paint and then place a mural of the military history of the region. Now, for a French Ninja War enthusiast like myself, it's fun trying to point out and name every little event featured. Jamonville Glen, Fort Necessity, Bragg's Defeat, it's all on the wall. This is what's dubbed the Mennonite Room, which portrays what the kitchen of a Mennonite home may have looked like in Pennsylvania. It's nice, except there was never anything like this in this room. This big open fireplace, it's truly just a very large art piece. Helen saw a fake fireplace like this at an expo and commissioned a replica erected in the house. The room was actually at one time the bedroom of Henry Clay Frick's elder sister, Mariah. A portrait of her in her elderly years looks over the room, possibly disapproving of her niece's changes. You'll also now find several portraits Helen left behind in the house. As time has passed, the focus of interpretation has shifted to different aspects of the village's life. There was a time when Henry Clay Frick was the main draw, a focus on how his coke empire began here. There was focus on the distilling processes West Overton. On my visit this year, the focus is on the story of the Overhaul family. And you know, that's, what's, that's when you know you truly have a special place in history. When you have multiple avenues of interpretation that are all correct and all equally important. Like most museums, there is focus on making things more interactive. But what about going after the senses like taste? To me, the best part of history, uh, historic food, because everyone knows what food is. Everyone has that connection to food. And seeing how it's done, historically speaking, it's an easy connection. People are interested. It's a lot of fun to try new recipes. I uh, do different methods, and I am a little bit of a nerd. A lot of these historic recipes, these historic cookbooks are public domains. So you can go on Project Gutenberg or Google Books, Google Amelia Simons, and you have her recipe book from 1796, and you just read through it, and you're like, what is this mess? Because, you know, there's no amounts. You know, you can, like, you just take some flour, take some et cetera, et cetera, and then... <laughs> As the time of recording, whiskey is being made once more in West Overton. There's about currently a thousand pounds of grain stored on site to produce small batches to sell to visitors and provide them a true taste of what made this place important. The first sales were made during their annual Christmas tours. Now, these tours have been occurring before. But 2021 took a different approach. Extensive research was done to portray how the Overhauls would have truly celebrated Christmas. Or more correctly, how they didn't. 
In the early days, there are records of the Overholts having a feast in honor of the winter solstice, but being Mennonites in the early 19th century, they had little interest in a pagan celebration. It wasn't until sometime around the 1860s that they began to soften up to the idea of a Christmas tree. There was no Santa yet, but there was a Belschnickel, a haggard figure in furs and a mask who visited prior to Christmas. If the child was naughty, they received a lashing by a switch. But if the kid had been good and not forced Abraham to take too many sips of rye, they would be renewed with fresh fruits and other goodies. Mariah Frick is said to have had a particular fear of Belschnickel, making sure to sway him with offerings of her own and dishes laid out around the house the night before his arrival, receiving a silver coin for her offerings. Our guide Ryan shared with me a story of the rise of the Christmas tree, not just in the overall household, but across rural America. The tree itself was brought in from pagan beliefs in Britain that the tree hosted a type of forest spirit. They became especially popular during the American Civil War, often being topped with an American flag. I personally could assume soldiers found it an easy display of the holidays to find and then kept doing it for their families after the war. After all, you just go out and cut a tree down. Trees became so popular in the 1870s, however, that there actually became a shortage. This forced the creation of the first Christmas tree farms to keep people from deforesting the area. The tree in the parlor room was to appear ugly on the tour to show the shortage, but I don't know, I think I like it. It's not overly Griswold. Aside from ornaments, smaller presents like these skates could also be hidden within the branches. But I guess kids didn't like getting all covered in sap, so they preferred Santa putting the small presents in their stockings. It's hard to do justice how nice the home looked that night. I highly recommend anyone in the area taking one of the Christmas tours next year. Make it a family tradition. There's other activities and several treats to try throughout the night. Of course, you don't have to come just in December. Generally, the museum is running regularly in the summer. For 2022, there are plans for a whole new exhibit in the distilling building covering the story of the workers that kept everything running here, from the farming to the distilling to even the later Coke ovens. There's a lot happening here and I look forward to coming back in the near future. This will probably be my last time I talk to you all in 2021, so thank you all who found and supported this small channel of mine. I've got to go to a lot of cool places this year, even in light of all the crap occurring in the real world. Merry Christmas, and remember, Happy Festivus!